I begin by reading um, from the opening pages of my newest book called Empty Cages. And it's from the prologue called The Cat. A few years ago, the Home Box Office Network aired a program entitled To Love or Kill, Man vs. Animals. It told a fascinating and at the same time a disturbing story about how different cultures treat the same animals differently. One especially chilling segment took viewers out to dinner in a small Chinese village. You know how uh, in America, and I'm sure here in Germany as well, uh, uh, patrons in some restaurants get to choose from among live lobsters or live fish. And how uh, after you make the selection, the animal is killed and the chef cooks a meal of your choice. At this Chinese restaurant, the things are the same, except the menu is different. At this restaurant, patrons get to select from among live cats and live dogs. The video takes its time. First, we see the hungry patrons inspect the cats and dogs jammed cheek by jowl into wooden cages. Next, we see them talk it over. Then we see them make their selection. Finally, we see a man yank a white cat from a cage and hurry into the kitchen. While the cat claws and screeches, the cook hits her several times with an iron bar. Clawing and screeching more now, she is abruptly submerged into a that tub of scalding water for about 10 seconds. Once removed and while still alive, the cook skins her from head to tail in one swift pull. He then throws the traumatized animal into a large stone vat where, as the camera zooms in, we watch her gulp slowly with increasing difficulty, her eyes glazed until her last breath taken, she drowns. The whole episode from selection to final breath takes several minutes. When the meal is served, the diners eat heartily, offering thanks and praise to the cook. So this is several years ago when I saw this for the first time. And I'll read my response to my reaction to that. I cannot ever remember being so stunned in all my life with what I had seen. I was literally speechless. Like many Americans, many Germans, I already knew that some people in China, Korea, and other countries eat cat and eat dog. The video didn't teach me any new fact about dietary customs. What was new for me, what pushed me back in my chair, was seeing how this is done, seeing the process, watching the awful shock and suffering of the cat was devastating. I felt a mix of disbelief and anger welling up in my chest. I wanted to shout, Stop it! What are you doing to this cat? Stop it! Well, unless I'm mistaken, I think everybody in this room shares with me this common core of compassion. Every one of us in this room, if we were to see something like this happening to a cat, we would want to oppose it. We would want to intervene. We would want to help the cat. We would want to stop what was being done to the cat. Every one of us in this room, I dare say, shares that common core of compassion, as do many Koreans, as do many Chinese, as do many other people where this sort of practice is common. Well. I'm an animal rights advocate and proud of it. And, and all that I think happens is this, that animal rights advocates like myself generalize on the response that all of us have to the cat episode. We don't limit our compassion to cats and dogs. We don't limit our compassion to members of our immediate family that live in the same apartment or home or dor dormitory room as we do. I mean, there are other animals in the world that are being exploited. There are 50 billion animals that are slaughtered every year in the world for consumption, just like that cat was. 
And that works out, I mean, if I, my math is right, it works out to incredible figures, somewhere in the neighborhood of 80,000 80, a minute are being slaughtered for food. And so, as animal rights advocates, what we want to do is what we're saying is we oppose what's being done to these animals. The major industries, animal abusing industries that turn animals into food, turn them into clothes, turn them into performers, turn them into competitors, turn them into tools. As animal rights advocates, we oppose what's being done to these animals. As animal rights advocates, we want to intervene. As animal rights advocates, we want to help. And as animal rights advocates, by God, we want to stop what's being done to animals. <laughs> Thank you. But that is what it is to be an animal rights advocate. It's to say the same thing that we all feel about that cat. The same compassion, the same sense of urgency, the same sense of the determination to help, to intervene, to stop, that we feel in the case of that cat or a dog. We feel in the case of hogs and, and chickens and porpoises and whales and the other animals that are being exploited. Now you have to wonder, how did we get this way? Because the one thing we know is there aren't that many of us. There may be our 1% or 2% of the American population, for example, that's vegetarian, a, a lesser percent that's vegan. And a great percentage of the 1% or 2% that are vegetarians are vegetarians for stomach reasons, for their health. You know, not a high fat, high, high cholesterol diet. They don't care about animal rights, they care about their health. And other people who are vegetarians are not particularly interested in animals, they're concerned about the environment, the devastation that occurs to the environment in order to feed the 50 billion animals that are slaughtered. And those animals have to eat something, that, and that food has to be grown somewhere, and there, is an, there are environmental costs. And so some of the 1% to 2% are vegetarians or vegans because of environmental reasons. But animal rights are vegans for animal rights reasons. And as I say, you have to wonder, how did we get this way? And I think from after more than 30 years, Nancy and I more than 30 years of activism and animal rights uh, advocacy, I don't think there's a single one answer. No, there's not a one-size-fits-all answer. I think there are at least three different paths that people take to end up where Nancy and I are, where end up where other animal rights advocates are. Where, as I say, what we want to do is not simply protect that cat, we want to protect the 50 billion. Some are Davincians, I call them. And I take this inspiration after Leonardo da Vinci. Of course, what we know about Leonardo, most of us anyhow, is he was a great painter. No, he's just a great painter, famous paintings. Less well known is that Leonardo was a great animal rights advocate in his time, in his way. When he was a very young boy, very young boy, he had an explanation about what meat was, where it came from, what, what is lamb, what is steak, what is chicken. And they explained to Leonardo what the source of this meat on the table was. He said, I'll have none of it. As a very young boy, he said, I'll have none of it. I'm, I'm done. And they said, well, at least at least drink the milk, at least eat the cheese. But where does it come from? So they explained to Leonardo where milk and cheese are. I have none of it, he said. At a very young age, he became a vegan on his own for reasons of compassion. He said to his friends who, were, who ate meat, he said, your stomach is the graveyard of animals, the tomb of animals, he called it. That's called it. where animals rot in your stomach. That's where they rot. That's what it is to eat an animal, is to bury it in your stomach where it rots. And he would have none of it. And when he would go into the markets in the, uh, and see uh, birds in cages who were being sold for, to stay in, in, in small cages with people, he would go and he'd spend his money on the birds and take them out and let them go. Free them where they belonged. So there is this path that some people have to animal rights advocacy that uh, it seems to me like there's just some people have a natural empathy and a natural compassion for animals and Leonardo personifies this once he understands his heart is too big you know, his heart is bigger than his stomach 
you know, my, my heart is too big. I can't, I can't do this. I mean, I, I, I have to protect them. And it's not something that he was taught. It's not something that was based on proof. He didn't have to be convinced. It wasn't figured out. It was just who he was. And over these years that we've been involved in advocacy, we have met some people like this, who at a very early age, once they understand what's going on, they want to they want to disengage from supporting it. But not many people, I think, in our experience, has been like that. More are what I call Damascans, and I call them Damascans after the famous story in the Bible about. Saul on the road to Damascus. And if you recall the story, it goes like this. Friends of Saul are up in Damascus. And they said, Saul, get up here. Come up here, because there's this preacher up here named Jesus, and people are starting to listen to him. And we want to we want to kind of get him out of town and, and discourage people from paying attention to what this man has to say. So Saul says, okay, I'm on the way. So off he goes on the road to Damascus. And on the road to Damascus, the heavens kind of shake and all this illumination and so on. And Saul hears Jesus speak to him from the heavens. And, the, and if you remember the words, he says, uh, the voice of Jesus says, Saul, Saul, why dost thou persecute me? And, and Saul is just overwhelmed by this. And on the basis of this single experience, on the basis of this single experience, Saul, one of the great detractors of Jesus, becomes Paul, perhaps the principal apostle of Jesus. Just transformed like that. And so Damascans, I think, are people who have this, as I say, transforming, life-altering experience. Uh, their life has changed, like from the, you know, from the, in one minute, uh, one way, and the next minute, the next, in the blink of an eye, so to speak. They enter into a new consciousness, a new way of understanding the world. And what they experience, what happens to them, is not something that's based on proof. It's not like a philosopher stands up before them and says, hey, here's an argument, premise one, here's premise two, here's this, that, and the other. It's not an argument that happens to them. They just have a life-altering experience. It's something that happens to them rather than something that they figure out. I'll give you an example that I, some years ago when I was in Berlin, I met a, a person who had a Damascan, a Damascan. And what happened to him was that uh, during the Second World War, there were, the Allies were bombing Berlin. And after the sirens uh, said all clear and people came out from the, the shelters and the, and the basements and so on, he came up onto the street of Berlin, streets of Berlin. And he could hear this clop, 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 and there was a horse running down the cobblestone streets of uh, where, he, where he was living. And he looked, and the horse was on fire. The horse was on fire from the very tip of the horse's tip, nose to the tail. Apparently, some gasoline had spilled all over the horse, and it got ignited, and the horse was just running madly down the street. And there's this boy. He's about 10 years old at the time, and he stands there, and the horse comes running right at him. And just before... Running, running into him, just before running over him, he looks him in the eye. He says they, they have this eye contact. And in that moment, this young boy's life was transformed. He thought at that moment, his role in the world was clear, that he was there to protect the animals. He was there to see that what happened to this horse would not happen to any other animal. He was transformed in the way that Saul was. And then there are people who I call mudlers. And I don't know if that's a word that you're familiar with in German, but muddlers are people who take their time about things. You know, they don't know where they're going. They don't, they're, 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 they don't have anything in the genes like uh, Leonardo. There's nothing that they bring to, this, to, to it that they're already com compassion and empathy and sympathy, and there's not, nothing dramatic or transforming. They, they just muddle along. They just they begin to think about things. They begin to ask questions, and they begin to find answers. And part of it involves their head. They ask factual questions and philosophical. What is veal? Where does veal come from? What are you telling me? Veal comes from that kind of animal? Raised, raised in confinement? Can't turn around? They feed it an anemic diet? 
to keep it in semi-darkness? I, I didn't know that. Yeah, that's true, Mr. Muddler, Miss Muddler, that's true. Oh, my gosh. Uh, then uh, what are you telling me about uh, 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 elephants? Elephants, uh, elephants, what, they walk 50 miles a day? How can they do that when they're tethered in, in, you know, in this cage in a zoo or, or, or travel in a circus? How can they travel 50 miles a day? So muddlers are just kind of muddle along. They're finding out this and finding out that. And then sometimes they have some, you know, some emotional experience. They might see the, the, they might see the cat episode on HBO and say, oh, my God, did you see that? And then the next thing that happens, you know, their, their heart starts to experience things. And one day, then, what happens is for muddlers, it's my experience anyhow, one day they wake up and they look in the mirror, and you know what? They see an animal rights advocate looking back at them. So the person in the mirror is an animal rights advocate. How did I become that? I, I didn't set out to become an animal rights advocate. But over time, that's what happens. That's what Nancy, that's our journey. You know, we were not... Da Vincians. We were not Damascans. We were just muddlers, just muddled along till we got to where we are. And so I'm assuming that most of you folks are muddlers, just because that's been our experience. And so for us, I mean, there is a question to ask, and that is the question, do animals have rights? And it's a very important philosophical question. And what we know is that whatever the answer is, we're not going to find it in the media. You know, in America, here's what happens. In the, uh, the media loves a plane crash. If a plane crashes, the media will be there. There's a story. When you have a safe landing, that's not a story. You know, when when uh, Nancy and I came, came uh, got in the train to uh, Heidelberg and got off and got off safely, you know what? There was no media there. There wasn't a newspaper person. There wasn't any video camera. They weren't covering it because it wasn't a story. The other thing we say in America is if it bleeds, it leads. If you kill somebody, you know, especially a particularly grisly murder, that's news. But if you help somebody, that's not news. If you know, if I, if I, uh, I got to tell you, I mean, if I, if I got naked and ran through the streets of Heidelberg and said, uh, "Free the animals! Free the animals! Free the animals!" I'd get media coverage. That's for sure. But here, any media here? Well, that's just the way it works. But we're not going to find answers in the media, and we're not going to find it in opinion polls where we say, what's the percentage of people who believe in animal rights? What's the percentage of people who think that animals shouldn't be test used in cosmetic testing? What's the percentage of people who think that animals, uh, elephants shouldn't be in circuses or that porpoises shouldn't be on in marine mammal display? What's the well, all that tells us is what people think. It doesn't tell us whether what people think is true, is reasonable, well-grounded, well-thought-out. doesn't tell us anything like that. And we're certainly not going to find the answer to the question about animal rights by saying, well, you know, we've never recognized animal rights here in, here, here in uh, Heidelberg. Never. No, that's, so that settles that. that. That's not going to be settle the issue. Now, if, if our unexamined traditions uh, uh, settled issues, women would still not vote. You know? I mean, women would still not own property. Women would still not uh, be able to file for divorce. Women will, would still not be uh, um, you know, find a place at the table of education if we simply accepted uncritically traditions. We don't, we don't believe that for a moment in other categories. Why should we believe it when it comes to the question about animal rights? It's only, I think, the only way you and I personally will find the answer that's, that we can embrace is by thinking independently, independent of media, independent of the polls, independently of our cultural traditions, and that is the invitation of philosophy. Philosophy's invitation, ask us to think for ourselves. Such a subject, you know, and think about it. I mean, when I, when, I, when I took chemistry and I walked into chemistry, my chemistry professors didn't say, the first thing I know, the most important thing for you is to think for yourself. Mm-mm. Mm -mm. The first thing the chemistry professor said is, learn this, know this, drill, drill, drill. When I walked into physics and calculus and biology and history, they didn't say, you're here to think for yourself. They never said anything remotely like that. They said, learn this, do the, you know, like that. But philosophy, what's the subject? It says, 
Think for yourself. Think for yourself. But, as I say, other, <laughs> think for yourself. But, um, you have to be logical when you do this, you know. You can't just say, uh, X is uh, X, X equals Y and Y equals Z, but X doesn't equal Z. No, you can't. I mean, you have to be logical when you, when you, when when we do our thinking, and we have to be factually informed, and we have to free ourselves from prejudice. There are some requirements. It's just not sitting around over beer, uh, waxing poetic. We have to try to have, try to satisfy some requirements, and so. My most fundamental reason for being here is, is, is not to try to persuade anybody that animals have rights. I don't think I have that power. You know, there are evangelists in, in the United States that go around and they give these talks, you know, that, that you're gonna, they're gonna convert you to this particular position. This, you're gonna come forward and say, oh, I believe, I believe. I'm, I'm not an evangelist. I'm not here to convert people. What I am here is to extend the invitation of philosophy. And that is, as I say, to think independently, to think hard, logically, factually informed, freeing ourselves from prejudice. So, when we say that animals have rights, we actually mean something by that. It actually has a content. It's not just saying, uh, I like animals a lot. No, when I say animals have rights, we actually are trying to say something when we say that animals have rights. And to understand what we're trying to say when we say animals have rights, obviously the, the best way to go is to find out, well, what do we mean when we say that human beings have rights? Because people have been thinking about human beings having rights for thousands of years, and people have been thinking about animals having rights for several decades, maybe. So we have a lot to learn from people who have gone before us. We can stand on the shoulders of our predecessors and have a better idea, see the things more clearly. And I'm talking here, of course, about moral rights. Legal rights are a different matter. Legal rights are questions of legislatures or despots or something. Here I'm talking about the whole idea of moral standing. And what we need to understand is that in our case, when you and I invoke our rights, what we're saying is, look, we, we deserve to be protected. We deserve to be protected. Uh, when it comes to our most important goods, and our most important goods are our life, our body, and our liberty. So rights serve this function in our moral thinking to say the individuals in this room deserve to be protected when it comes to the integrity of their life, the integrity of, of your, your body, the integrity of your liberty. And, and in this sense then, Rights are place limitations on other people's freedom. That's that's the, their function in in the the moral sphere. Uh, your rights limit my freedom, and the same is true vice versa. My rights limit yours. And, and so, in this sense, we can think of rights as as it were like invisible no trespassing signs. And what I'm saying here is then something like this: See, you may want to. But morally, you're not free to invade my body. You may want to, but morally, you're not free to injure me or to crush my organs or to blind me or to break my arms. You know, you're not free to invade my body. It's already occupied. In case you haven't noticed, there's somebody here. It's, this body belongs to somebody. No trespassing. And when it comes to my life, again, you're not at liberty to take it. It's not yours. It happens to belong to somebody. It's mine. And the same in your case, too. I'm not at liberty to take yours or yours. And the same is true when it comes to freedom. You are not at liberty to take my freedom. And I'm not at liberty to take your freedom when it comes to morality. So the first thing about rights is it places limits on the freedom of others. The second is that rights take priority over other important moral considerations. When we invoke our rights, we're invoking what I think is the most powerful consideration when it comes to thinking morally. And the best way I have of trying to illustrate what this means is to use an exa example from uh, a card game. We were talking about this earlier. 
And, and this is a game that you're probably not familiar with, but this is, co is a game called Bridge. So let me give you this example. We're playing a game, card game called Bridge, and in this particular hand, diamonds are trump. Play the queen of spades. Rainer plays the king of spades. You play the ace of spades. It's my turn to play. Four players. I don't have any spades, but diamonds are trump in this particular hand that we're playing, and I do have the two of diamonds. In the game of bridge, trumps are so powerful, such a powerful card, that the two of diamonds beats the queen of spades. It beats the king of spades. It even beats the ace of spades. That's how powerful the trump suit is in the game of bridge. Well, if we think about morality as a game, we say, well, what are, what are some of the cards that are played in this game? Well, there's social custom, obviously, and there's, there's uh, personal gain, there's the, the public good, and then there are the rights of the individuals. Here's what we're saying then, where we say that rights are trump. Let's take social custom as our example. What we're saying is this. Uh, you can't justify violating the rights of Anna. Okay, you can't justify violating your, violating your rights because the rest of the people in the room are going to are going to benefit. We're, we're not justified in breaking your leg or, you know, pulling your eyes out or uh, throwing you in prison or uh, taking your life because the rest of our, us are going to benefit. I'll give you a historical example. In the United States in the, in the 1940s, and this went on, this research went on for more than 30 years, funded by the United States government. There were roughly 400 black. Uh, migrant workers uh, who were told that they had bad blood and they were given not any cure for their bad blood they were given a sugar pill what they had was syphilis you're familiar with that idea the, the disease syphilis what they had was syphilis and what the purpose of the research was was not to help them not to cure them, not to benefit them. The purpose of it was to find out what happened if they didn't receive medical treatment. The purpose of it was to see how long it took them to die. The purpose was to see what the complications were. And for 30 years, the federal government, the United States of America, the federal government funded this research. Now, no serious advocate of human rights, and I count myself among those people, would approve of this research. And you say, well, why, why? Look, the social, the public good, all these benefits for society. Uh, look at the, all, the, all these future generations of syphilis sufferers, how they benefited from this research. No, 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 no. Not if you're an advocate of human rights. The violation of the rights of the individual, Trump, are more important. They're the two of diamonds against the ace of spades, against the public good. That's what it means when we argue for it. That's what it means when you invoke. That it is what it is mean when we believe in the rights of the individual. Rights are equal. Remember first, rights are no trespass. Rights place limits on other people's freedom reciprocally. Rights are more, most powerful consideration. They trump other considerations. They're more important than public good. They're more important than Rainer's uh, personal uh, advantage. They're more important than, than uh, honoring so, social customs. And they are equal. My rights are no greater than yours, and your rights are no greater than mine. When it comes to rights, they are the same. They are equal. When we say then that, animal, that human beings have rights, we mean something. We're trying to say something rather than just saying, oh, I like human beings a lot. That's not what we're saying. We're trying to say, no, no, no. Uh, human beings are to be protected. Uh, you and I are to be protected. You know more than me. Me know more than you. Uh, against the same sorts of things, against the, the, the power of custom, against the, those who seek their own advantage, against those who want to advance the public good. Well, do any animals have rights? Now we know what we're asking. What we're asking is, do any animals have the same moral status that you and I have? That their life and their freedom and their liberty should be protected? The respect for their life and their liberty and their bodily integrity trumps 
public good, social custom, personal gain. And when it comes to their rights, they're no greater than ours, and ours are no greater than theirs when it comes to life and integrity and bodily integrity. In it. That's what we're asking. So there really is a question. And to answer that question, are, they, do they, are there any animals like us in these respects? Uh, we know we're going to have to ask two really hard kinds of questions. One are going to be factual questions and to ask, well, what is the case? What's true as a matter of fact? And others are going to be foundational questions. And the foundational questions go to the very heart of the issue. They're going to say, who has rights and why? So that question then, do animals have rights, has to be viewed within this context of factual questions and foundational questions. And the main factual questions, I think, are these two. Are any animals like us physically? You know, kind of look around at them. Is there any uh, important similarity between our bodies and the bodies of other animals? And then the second question is, are any animals like us mentally? See, because if, if it were the case, and it's p certainly possible, there's a possible world, see, where you know, we'd walk around, we'd kind of look at our physiology and look at our anatomy and say, you know, there's not another single animal in the world that's like us physically. That's certainly possible, possible world. Uh, and so, yeah, it's possible. And similarly, it could be the case that, the, that you go around and you actually look and you think about this as hard as you can and you say, you know, there's not another single animal that's like us mentally. Not in any respect. It's possible. If that's true, see, then the argument for animal rights really is, gets pretty weak. It'd be, if, if that were true, it would be like trying to say, chalk has rights. Chalk has rights. You say, well, it's not like us physically. That's okay. Uh, it's not like, that's okay. It still has rights. It's, well, it's a pretty weak argument. I mean, it's not like us in a, any respect. It's hard to see how they have rights because we have rights. But see, the closer you find a resemblance between the physical makeup of other animals and the mental makeup of other animals, it's going to be harder and harder to say we've got rights and they don't. So these questions, I think, are where the action is. And so we say physically, look around. Remember, we're going to be unprejudiced. We're going to kind of open our eyes, look around, and say, are there any animal, animals like us? Do they have sense organs? Do any have a central nervous system? Do uh, they have a brain? Uh, well, mammals and birds do. Last I checked. I don't mean to be an expert. I don't think I'm an expert when it comes to biology and other sorts of things. But the last I checked, I mean, these animals are fundamentally like us when it comes to their physical and anatomical makeup. And the others are saying, well, fish, fish. What about fish? Hmm. Maybe, maybe. But certainly, maybe it's worth thinking about. What I'm saying here, see, is that, that, that there is this kind of striking similarity. Of course, as you know, that, that Dar Darwin saw more than 100 years ago. He said, well, what about mentally? Um, are any animals like us uh, mentally? And it certainly is possible uh, that they're not. It could be that when you look at the mind of an, uh, other animals, there's nothing there. It's just an absolute empty glass. There's nothing going on. A cat and dog you share your life with at home, you go back, you go home, open the door, they jump up and down, nothing is going on behind those eyes. They're not aware of anything. They don't care about anything. They don't like anything. They don't remember anything. It's certainly possible. Uh, no sensations, no desires, no emotions, no beliefs, nothing. So, well, uh, actually, there's a little bit going on. Not a whole lot going on behind those eyes, uh, just a little bit. So there's a little, you know, they, it's very nominal when it comes to sensations and desires and emotions and beliefs. And that's certainly a possible position. But unless I miss my guess, unless I miss my guess, you go back and think about that cat and that episode, the cat episode, and we try to think about that cat, we're going to say, no, 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 that, that cat had a lot going on in that in that in the mental life of that animal. And it was robust in terms of what the cat could sense and what it wanted and what the emotions it felt and its beliefs. So very robust. You know, when I say this, I'm only saying what Darwin said. Darwin's a much smarter man than me. I defer to Darwin. And when you when you read what Darwin says and he, he studies the the behavior of other animals, as he says, with an unprejudiced eye, with an unbiased eye. What he says is, I mean, 
these animals remember and they expect and they plan and they intend and they like and dislike and they fear. Now, they're complicated psychological creatures. They're what I call subjects of a life. They're somebody, not something. They have a biology, biography, not simply a biology. There's something really going on there. There are living beings who are in the world, aware of the world, aware of what happens to them and what happens to them matters to them because it makes a difference to the quality of their life as they experience it. Whether I care about it or not, whether you care about it or not, or whether anybody cares about it or not. What happened to that cat mattered to that cat. It made a difference to the what it was like to be that cat in the world. So what I'm suggesting, then, is that those animals I talked about are not like Chuck. They resemble us physically, anatomically. They resemble us psychologically, mentally. You know, it might be hard for us to see that because our culture doesn't encourage it. But that's what I think the truth of the matter lies, you know. They, they are some bodies, not some things. Foundational question, who has rights and why? Really hard questions. Philosophers, as I said, have been debating this for a long time. And depending on how we answer this, animals are going to either fare well or fare ill. So that, for example, if somebody says, all and only those who are morally responsible have rights, then, I don't know about animals then. Here's what, here's what they, when these philosophers, Kant, this is Kantian in spirit, uh, this is the sort of thing that Kant would say if he were here, I think. Uh, to be morally responsible means that, that uh, we're able to th think about uh, the choices that present, uh, present themselves to us. And we're able to weigh the rightness and the wrongness of the choice we make. And then without being uh, coerced by any, anyone else, we personally, individually, choose to behave as we do. And if we choose to do the right thing, well, then we deserve some praise. And if we choose to do the wrong thing, then we deserve some blame. Because, after all, we're the one who made the choice. So, for example, if, if, if the question was, um, mm. uh, going out uh, late, late tonight and somebody's minding their own business, walking down the streets of Heidelberg, and I go, out, go, go up and I knock them in the head and knock them out and steal their purse or steal their wallet, and, and, and then off I go. Well, the idea is, see, I mean... As, assuming that nobody coerced me to do this, I would, I'm the one who made that choice. I'm the, and so I'm responsible for that choice. I bear the burden of that choice. Uh, and I, I, hopefully somebody will find out about it, blame me, punish me for that choice. All entirely appropriate. But when, when we think about cats and dogs and porpoises and, and coyotes and, and chickens and uh, turkeys, it's really hard to think of them as being morally responsible for anything they do. You know, here's, here's a turkey walking around. He's going to say, well, have you thought about the rightness or wrongness of what you've been doing? Huh? Uh, I mean, uh, it seems to me, I mean, the turkey's going to look at you very, with a very blank stare and say, I mean, I don't know what you're talking about, uh, right or wrong. Uh, animal, animals, uh, uh, or again, you take a case like there's a lion and there's a wildebeest on the Serengeti Plain. And the lion's sitting there and, there's, and looking for dinner, and there comes the wildebeest. And there goes the line after the Willoughby's. And we, uh, and we stand, stand up and say, no, no, no. I mean, don't you know the difference between right and wrong? I mean, of course lions don't know the difference between right and wrong. No, they're not, they're not morally responsible for what they do. They do what they do, but they're not morally responsible for it. So if you would take this idea that you, you have to be morally responsible in order to have rights, then the person, then you can say, animals really are like us physically. They really are like us anatomically. They really are like us psychologically, but they're not really like us when it comes to moral responsibility. So they don't have rights, and we do. So, if that's true, remember, so then they don't have the protections against the, their body is not protected morally, their life is not protected, their liberty is not protected, so we would not do anything wrong in principle. Anyhow, if we took their life injured their body, stole their freedom. There's just this little problem. Not all human beings are morally responsible. 
For example, Nancy and I have four grandchildren. The one is one. He's a terror. Uh, his idea of having fun is finding something to break. Uh, you know, he gets his hands on things. He wants to break them, including his sister. Uh, he wants to break. You know, just his, that's his idea of fun. And so we're kind of no, no. But see, the the point is that uh, this little fellow doesn't sit around. He doesn't understand right, wrong, uh, blameworthy, praiseworthy. He doesn't have the foggiest idea about moral responsibility. Not the foggiest idea. So do we say, oh well, then we're not limited. We can we can injure his body. We can we can take his life as we please. No, we don't say that. We say what we do say is. By God, that young boy has rights even though he's not morally responsible. Don't we say that? That's what I think we say. But then, see, if we're going to be logical, which is what philosophy says, then we can't say, that young boy has rights even though he's not morally responsible. Well, then we can't say, but you know, lions and tigers and bears don't have rights because they're not morally responsible. That's inconsistent. We're being inconsistent. We're having one standard for human beings, another standard for animals. That's not consistent. That's not logical. Somebody said, well, they have to be self-aware. Yes, cats and dogs and porpoises and elephants are in the world aware of the world aware of what happens to them. What happens to them matters to them, but they don't know they're in the world. They're not aware of being in the world. And then in particular, what a lot of philosophers say, and therefore they don't know they're going to die. You know, you have to know you're in the world in order to know you're going to leave the world. And since they don't know they're in the world, they don't know they're going to leave the world. They don't know they're going to die. They have no idea about being dead. And that's why, even though they're like us physically and anatomically, we have rights and they don't. Hmm. Where's my grandson? He had the foggiest idea that he's in the world. He has no idea he's going to die someday. And so do we say, well, then he's not protected when it comes to his body or his freedom or his life. We don't. We say, no, 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 no. He has the same rights as you do, same rights as I do. And they're, and they're equal, we say. We really do say that. We insist upon it, in fact. But then we can't be logical. We say, oh, well, my grandson doesn't have to be self-aware in order to have rights, but by God, chickens have to be self-aware in order to have rights. We don't say that if we're going to be logical, which is, again, one of the requirements. I don't know how philosophers got to say this, but they do. They say, in order to have rights, you have to be able to use language. I'm not kidding you. They do say this. I mean, I'm, and then they say, uh, all those animals I've been talking about don't speak English. They don't even speak German. And, uh, and they say, and therefore, therefore, we have rights and they don't have rights. And I can only tell you that it just, uh, it seems to me to be uh, uh, such a bizarre idea that you have to have, be able to speak a language in order to have rights. It seems like there's no logical connection between two. I can see why you have to be able to speak in order to do crossword puzzles or something. But, I mean, the idea that you have to be able to speak a language in order to have rights just doesn't make any sense to me at all. And, uh, and so I'm not going to belabor the point. And then people say, oh, well, here's the difference. Here is the difference. Yes, they are like us physically. Yes, they are like us, you know, in physiology and anatomically. Yes, they are like us psychologically. Yes, they are somebody, not something. Yes, they have a biography, not just a biology, but they don't have a soul. And it just so happens that we all do. It's so convenient, isn't it? I mean, we all do. We all do. And so there's my, there's our grandson. He's got one too. Now we find the difference. Uh, why he has rights and we have rights and they don't have rights. Uh, well, I hope I have a soul. I think it would be a very nice thing. I really do hope I have a soul. I've always thought this. Because, I mean, it would be so interesting, wouldn't it, uh, after our body dies, that somehow or other we go on living? I mean, that's really an exciting prospect. I mean, I'm, I'm voting in favor of that. I mean, I, I, I hope that's true. I hope it's true for you, too. I mean, it would, it would be nice. But see, I just can't see, again, any logical connection between what's going to happen to me after I die, after I die because I have a no mortal soul, I'm going to continue to live, and my moral status now, before I die. I just don't see how the, the, the one has any logical bearing on the other. Plus, notice this, and this, this is a, a, an idea I don't take credit for. It's the idea of C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis, very famous 
20th century Christian theologian? Anybody know that name? C.S. Lewis? Okay. C.S. Lewis argues this way. He says, you know, I actually think that we have souls and animals don't have souls. And so after we die, there's a future life for us. And after they die, there is no future life. And then he says, which is really interesting, precisely because that's true. We have to make sure that we don't injure their body unnecessarily and don't take their life unnecessarily and don't deny their freedom unnecessarily because the bad things that happen to them in this life can't be made up for them in some future life because they don't have one. See, he actually turns the idea right on its head. Rather than their lacking souls giving us a blind check to exploit them, oh no, it's just the opposite. Because they don't have souls, our fundamental obligation is to protect them. Protect them. Not eat them, not wear them, not experiment on them. Help that cat. That's what Lewis would say. Subjects of the life. This is the view that I argue for. And, for example, someone I see someone has a copy of... of uh, uh, the case for animal rights, this is the position that I try to defend. And remember what I mean by that. When, I'm, when I talk about a subject of life, I'm saying someone who's in the world, aware of the world, aware of what happens to them, what happens to them matters to them, matters to them. Whether anybody else cares about it or not, it makes a difference in the quality of their life for them, for the cat, for example. And see, if that's the answer that we give, if that's the answer after thinking logically and carefully and being informed and trying to free ourselves from prejudice, we finally come to this idea that subjects of a life, that's it. That's the foundation of rights. That's the foundation. That's what makes you and I the same. That's what makes you and I and our grandson the same. That's what makes all of us uh, fundamentally the same. And then if they're fundamentally the same, then we're going we're gonna to say, oh boy, now... Now we're in for some readjustment in our life. Because, and I'll skip over some things here, I'll skip over these, some of these object, objections because, and just go to the practical implications, because if it's subjects of a life that have, have, have rights, then remember, rights are trump. The little two of diamond beats the queen of spades, the king of spades, the ace of spades. We can't justify harming animals because uh, social custom or personal gain or the public good. We, you know, it's not a sufficiently good moral reason to kill animals for food because there's lots of, you know, Mockburst in Heidelberg. I mean, that's not a sufficiently good reason to kill animals. That it's just a, we've been eating Mockburst in Heidelberg for. Generations. I mean, that's not sufficiently a reason, or, that, uh, or, the, or the public good again. And these implications for the, the, the quality and character of our own life, as I say, apply to what we eat, the clothes we wear, how we learn, what we do for fun. So, do animals have rights? If you're a dimension, you already have answered that question because of the mystery of compassion and sympathy and, uh, that you brought with you, like Leonardo. And if you're a Damascan, then uh, there's an, I'm, I mean, I'm not in the business of, of being an evangelical here. I'm not trying to have people come on down and declare your allegiance to animal rights. I mean, it's not, that's, I don't think that uh, that's it. But if you're a muddler, like uh, I've been and Nancy have been, that we know we can't find the answers in the media or in public opinion polls or unexamined traditions. We can only find the answer by thinking independently, which is the invitation of philosophy. And philosophy of invitation is to think for ourselves, my God. Think for ourselves, but using logic, being factually informed, freeing ourselves from prejudice. And as I said before, at the very outset, and I'll conclude by saying this again, thanking you for your gift of time, that the fundamental purpose of my remarks has been to extend that invitation. Dankeschön.